This is Dr. Victor Aquista. I'm reading from my sci-fi novel, Sentient. The mind warriors of Trox, intent on being the supreme sentient race in the galaxy, annihilated the home world of Aden, a place where people had lived telepathically connected in peace and harmony. A species' slim chance to survive rests in a distant colony, genetically altered to block telepathy and evade detection by Trox. Enuros escaped the destruction of Aden, traveling disembodied for 168,000 years before arriving on New Aden, only to learn of the disastrous consequences of the genetic manipulation, violence, poverty, abuse, prejudice. Trox is on the verge of collapse, a result of social stagnation and infighting among the clans. Discovery of New Aden, the lost colony, provides a chance to reinvigorate their race with a fresh conquest. However, Discovering their past mission was incomplete, a resulting conflict ensues, but a troubled physicist, his young neighbor, and an artificial intelligence may be the key to defeating them. Heroic misfits and outcasts are woven into three intersecting storylines and will determine humanity's fate. Book Lovers Unite! I'm Demetheus Jackson, and you're listening to the Chapter One Podcast. On today's episode, I'll be speaking with Dr. Victor Aquista. He's become a successful book author and speaker following his medical career as a primary care physician and medical executive. He previously co-founded the Collaborative for Community Health. He's the founder and co-founder of a number of community programs and is an advocate for social awareness, personal growth and transformation. Today, Victor will be reading from his book entitled Sentient, and it starts right now. Chapter One, Home, Aden. It was, Jardin reflected, primarily a ceremonial position. He sighed. Until recently, his major responsibility had been to preside at celebrations. Nothing in their history, nothing from their past could have prepared them for this onslaught. As a people, their only knowledge of intentional killing came from the primitives on worlds like Selos VI and Tandridge. On those worlds, they used all manner of weapons to fight among themselves. No, he reasoned, it wasn't a matter of not being prepared. We simply had no notion of what to prepare for. We have done our best. Chief Minister, he sensed Kalissa approaching his chamber, Linked to her thoughts and to her unease, they have penetrated into the sanctuary. Jardin stood, gazing at the well-manicured gardens, the scholar's enclave in the distance, the radio meditation paths, joining at the central cascading fountain of the three moons. The soft red of midday colored Astar's shrine. Yes, Calissa, I see their progress. Come join me. The Hymera so inauspicious, yet so sweetly fragrant, gifted their delicate blossoms to the gentle breeze. He watched as they danced and spiraled downward, carpeting the shrine archway with their petals and white fragrance. In this final moment of tranquility, he sighed and whispered aloud, at least they will survive. Death or slavery? He pondered these choices, then chastised himself over such a foolish inquiry. All that really mattered was to shield knowledge of the colony. With disciplined effort, he forced himself to bury the memories of their hasty planning into the deepest recess of his mind. Defeat by the mind warriors of Trox was a certainty, yet defeat could not describe such annihilation. If Aiden is to survive, it can only be on new Aiden. These thoughts became shadows, dispelled by light, and Jartan awoke from his trance, still and resolute. He glanced at the obelisk on his desk, appreciating the delicate carvings and fluid lines that shaped it to its top, the pointed star of Silos. Emissaries had gifted it to the last chief minister, who had left it among the sparse furnishings in the minister's chambers. Calissa entered. A strange look of fear and sadness colored her features. As Aiden crumbled, the look had become all too familiar. They both knew what to expect. Jardin tried to comfort her. Soon Astar shall greet us. The image erupted in his mind a moment before the Troxen entered. The warrior stood before him, shorter than most Adonites and physically broader with a prominent forehead, 
but those were hardly the most striking features. Jardin sensed his mind. Its order and discipline was nothing less than astounding. A series of concentric arrays, complex yet simple, with a precision that was both alien and beautiful. He tried to probe further, but the invader's mind shield was impenetrable. This one wore a yellow sash. A hand blade dangled from his belt. You are leader of this world. It was a statement, not a question. Telepathically projected into his mind. Yield to Scarlet, soldier to the Supreme Council of Trox. I am Jartan, chief minister of Aden. You are defeated. Skalek glanced at Kalissa, and Jardin staggered backwards, buffeted by the burst of the alien's mental force. He tried to link with Kalissa, but raw fear blocked her mind. Helpless, Jardin watched as blood began to stream from her nose. As she collapsed, he whispered, Astar welcomes you, and prepared his shield. He would use his most distant memories. They were deepest in his mind. From his before time, during his giraffe, he was purely defensive. But this assault upon the chief minister's mind was different. Not a wave of mental force, so much as a sharp piercing. It was as though pieces of his mind were being searched one by one. He stood frozen, powerless to stop this total violation. He focused on his mother, remembering how patient and forgiving she had been. Irath will come, my son. How often she had to remind him. He smiled, recalling her gentle reassurance and allowed a tendril of thought to touch the warrior's mind. Through it he felt another world, another civilization, whose only intent at this moment was his subjugation. Dimly, he became aware of slices of his own mind falling away. The Troxen's eyes bulged slightly with concentration. This one is strong. When Arath finally came, it was his mother's mind that he first linked to. The first bonding was always the strongest. Jardin recalled the pure joy and wonder of his awakening, as when light first enters darkness. Always when he linked to Mother, he felt her strength and protection. Aimlessly floating in this happy memory, no fear blocked his mind and his shield held. As he recalled his mother's gentle features, her soft, knowing brown eyes, he sensed a trickle of blood rolling down his upper lip. Skalek smiled broadly, nostrils flaring over clenched teeth. How has this knowledge been protected? There will be more to defeat. My rank shall advance. As the Troxen's thoughts penetrated Jardin's head, very calmly, the chief minister picked up the obelisk. Shifting his awareness, he noted the blood smell somehow intensified the sweetness of the Hymera. Curious. As a smile began to blossom on the chief minister's face, he stared directly at the warrior, then slid the star of Silos into his own eye. He blocked the pain as blackness enveloped him. Scala grunted. He had not anticipated this. The Adnite leader had committed Jan Fear. Ska will inform the council of defeat by Jan Fear. Ska will share knowledge of a new Adnite colony. The council will augment my honor. Clan Lect will gain. Viewing the chief minister's body, his nostrils quivered. Not long before Ska sits on sub-council. He looked at Jartan with the respect due a worthy opponent. Then, almost as an afterthought, he decided to complete the Jan Fear ceremony. Unsheathing his Jan, he pressed the blade across his wide forehead and spoke the closing. I honor you as one who fought well. Only the superior prevail. Aten etin, I asked. Yeah, well, I'm really glad to have you on. I was really looking forward to speaking with you today because you and I are very similar. Whereas I write self-help fantasy, you write socially conscious science fiction, meaning that there's an underlying message that your stories address. Yet you also have a medical background. Can, can you tell us a little more about yourself and how you made that transition into science fiction? Sure. Um... My uh, medical background is as a primary care internist. We are practitioners of adult medicine. Uh, and I uh, segued from my primary care uh, physician career into administrative medicine and um, worked uh, for many years with the developmentally disabled in the state of Massachusetts 
and eventually um, developed expertise in long-term care and, and caring for seniors and was the chief medical officer of um, a healthcare facility here in New Mexico working for the Department of Health. I um, had written a book during my um, you know, work actively as a physician. It was a self-help book. Uh, but I had this story in my head for over 20 years, this science fiction novel that I uh, finally had the courage to say, what I want to do is step away from uh, clinical and administrative medicine and focus full time on writing and speaking. And um, I made that transition a couple of years ago. You know, being that you were just so entrenched within the medical industry that, you know, writing sci-fi may have seemed almost a little off-putting. Like, was this something that just naturally came to you since you had the story for a while? Or was it something that you really had to carefully dip your toe in to see if this was the right fit? You know, I, I think that's an excellent question. And uh, my answer for it. Uh, might, might seem a little bit odd, but uh, I think much of the nonfiction writing is more of a left brain um, effort. You're collecting information um, and somehow weaving that together to try and communicate an idea or a message. Uh, to me, writing fiction and um, I've written an, another complete novel. It's a fiction novel. It's an adventure novel. But both the science fiction and you know, fiction in general, it, to me, is more of a right brain activity. There's just a vast uh, playscape to um, you know, explore and uh, use your imagination and creativity to come up with a plot and characters and how you want uh, to message, what, in my case, whatever social messaging I want to incorporate into the storyline. Uh, and to, to me, this is something that didn't just suddenly come out. It's something that's been there all along, and I finally uh, allowed myself license to you know, fully engage that creative right brain part of my, my head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very important to have that balance, especially if if you're, you know, primarily analytical or very left brained. Do you find writing science fiction a challenge at times or is it a nice release for you? It's not so much a challenge as something that I just totally enjoy. Um, it's playing in a way. It's not work uh, to you come up with an idea and and then go with it. I actually have a fantasy uh, novel planned um, after I complete what I'm currently writing, which is satire. I know that that seems odd, but I, I don't like to confine myself to any single genre. And I find that uh, it's just it, it's not so much a release as it's just having a lot of fun. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I've never thought of it like that, but you're absolutely right. It is just another form of play. Well, there's an expression, you know, something along the lines of, you know, find something you love to do and you never work a day in your life. <laughs> uh, and that's not to say I didn't enjoy being a primary care physician. I didn't enjoy uh, being an administrative physician, but... Um, those were not nearly as much fun, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> right. And also, it's it's another form of expression for you. And you're actually using your writing as a social platform for awareness. Right. That is the common thread that links all of my writing. Um, I, I came up with a tagline, writing to raise consciousness. And that that is an important driver and motivator for me to... Uh, express ideas and social themes in, in a way that hopefully engages the reader and, and has some things beyond just the pure entertainment value of you know whatever the literature is or whatever I've written. Yeah, yeah. What are some of the social themes that you tackle within Sentient? One of the social themes is, well, what is the effect of being um, individually isolated from everyone else? 
Uh, and is that one of the ways that uh, competition becomes an important uh, aspect to survival, that we're in competition with one another rather than in cooperation? So that's a huge theme in, in sentient. Another theme uh, has to do with uh, our treatment of individuals with mental illness, because in the book, uh, some of the main characters suffer from mental illness, and they are you know, considered to be outcasts and misfits and what have you, uh, when in fact it's a, it's a mischaracterization. Uh, and there's a certain um, uh, other aspects of social commentary that the uh, main protagonist, who's from the home world but had escaped um, and arrives on Earth 168,000 years after the genocide of his home world, uh, he is uh, sort of uh, an observer of, of what he sees in society and compares it to the home world and says, you know, it's not really the way our species is supposed to be. So there's a lot of commentary along the way. But I don't think it's over, you know, it's not getting up on a soapbox and preaching. It's more asking the reader to think about these things. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because nobody wants to be preached to or lectured to. And I think that the trick is to create a story that's entertaining. And that does challenge us the way that folks think, or maybe not even challenge, but exposes them to perspective beyond themselves, which I think is what you're doing. This is a really vast yet intricate story that you've created with a lot of moving parts. Can you introduce us to some of your main characters? And specifically, what happens to the humans and who are the Trox? Trox is the alien homeworld. They are also uh, telepathic, but they are a clan-based society and they are highly competitive at all levels of their social structure. Characters on the colony, there are just six colonists, four women and, and two men. They won't get into details, but they're all struggling with being separated not only from the, the greater collective, but they take a medication to prevent them from telepathically communicating with one another because they're fearful that uh, the telepathic communication will elate and they will cause them to be discovered by Trox. The, the protagonist, Aneros, is the, the one who escaped the home world, and um, he is a musician. He's really not um, a heroic kind of guy. He's just a, an ordinary man. The other uh, two characters that are worth mentioning is uh, Professor Jeremy Strickland, he is a brilliant physicist, but he suffers with schizophrenia and has been ostracized by his colleagues and, and by the scientific community. But he's developed a technology uh, that allows um, transport technology, the conversion of mass to energy, energy back to mass. And um, Andros winds up materializing in his laboratory. That's uh, an important plot element. Are there any parts of your story that are inspired by real-world events or situations? Well, I think the most sh striking um, th thing that reflects the real world is occurring on the alien world of Trox, uh, because th their uh, government is very dysfunctional. There are seven major clans. One is the outcast clan, and they're no longer on the council. So there are six clans, and they're allied three against three. Uh, and the leader is almost powerless to get anything done because um, the, the, the three balanced against the other three pretty much negate everything he's trying to accomplish to advance society. So if you want to draw parallels to um, a two-party government system, <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that readers do uh, m make that connection. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You're also involved in a lot of other things. Um, for example, you provide workshops and you make appearances. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I'm actually uh, doing a presentation on socially conscious science fiction that's coming up December 4th. 
Um, but the workshops that I give are really um, in the area of personal growth and transformation. Uh, I have a series of workshops that I call the Life Skills Learning Series and talk about um, several topics such as forgiveness, uh, grief, um, stress management. They're, they're health themes, but they're um, more geared towards uh, helping people understand themselves in a different context in a way that um, helps them to grow and develop uh, in consciousness. It seems like you're really driven, like this is your passion, like spreading awareness. Yes, I, uh, I have been interested in uh, consciousness and consciousness studies for many, many years. And um, I'm, I, even in my, my background in medicine, um, I spent almost 10 years working with the developmentally disabled. That's a, you know, a population that's a little bit disenfranchised and um, marginalized. Uh, and even the work that I did here in New Mexico for the Department of Health, you don't work for the Department of Health because they pay you well. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Based on your own experience and the experiences of your characters, what advice would you give to people who are coping with the current social climate? In general, I am a hopeful and optimistic person. Um, and I think that uh, we have... Uh, institutions in place uh, to help have an effective government that addresses the, the problems that we have in our society. Our, our society is still growing and learning and evolving. Um, in, in some ways, you can think of it as a, um, a child. A child sometimes misbehaves and sometimes stumbles and falls, but uh, they're, they're growing and you have to cut them a little slack. So I think patience and forgiveness are good life strategies to um, employ in dealing with life in general. And that in includes our current political climate. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in, in tolerance and uh, inclusiveness and embracing other people, other cultures, other beliefs, um, and trying to get along, because at the end of the day, we have similar we, we have similar desires. You know, we want to be happy and healthy and 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 safe and secure. Um, it's how we go about achieving those goals that sometimes um, gets people a little hot under the collar. But I think if we fall back and, and recognize the things that unite us, which are our common desire, uh, I think that that's uh, a, a good place to find common ground. Yeah. And I think you're right also in saying that we are a pretty young country. I hadn't even really thought about that in a while. I think we're hitting um, 250 years old. What's interesting is that I have some friends living in Italy and they have furniture in their house that's older than the country is. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> so That's funny. Yeah, so we really do have uh, a lot of growing to do. And, and I think ultimately we're going to get there. I do. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Where can readers find you and your stories online? I have a website, uh, www.victoraquista.com. It's V-I-C-T-O-R-A-C-Q-U-I-S-T-A. -I, I have an Amazon uh, author page as well, and I have a, a Facebook account, Victor Aquista Author. I'm on Twitter as Victor Aquista. So I have a you know, a modest presence on social media. And with that, we'll wrap up another episode. Thanks again to Dr. Aquista for speaking with us today. And I highly recommend reading Sinti. It's one of those stories where there's so much to touch on and we could have easily had a two hour conversation. I really think Sentient is a book that my sci-fi and fantasy lovers are gonna enjoy. And as always, if you have a question or comment about this episode, or you know an author who you think will be a good fit for the show, let me know. Send an email to info at ch1podcast.com 
or connect with me on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff. Okay, that's it for me. Till next time.